Well, a very warm welcome to you all and uh, a special warm welcome to those of you watching on YouTube and, and Facebook too, right? Yes. Yes, and Facebook too, right. Um, as we uh, come together, let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you that you are with us, whether it's cold or hot, whatever the weather. Thank you that we can depend on you as our unchanging, faithful one. And thank you that we can gather in this way, that we can sing your praises, we can speak to you, and we can hear from you as well. And so we pray, Father, this evening that you'd help us to, be, uh, to have our ears open to what you have to say to us. And uh, would you accept our praise? For Jesus' sake. Amen. So we're going to begin by singing, O oh my soul, arise and bless your maker.
Father, on a day like today, we are reminded of our, our weakness, uh, how whether it's hot or cold, we can uh, feel our weakness. And uh, during a global pandemic, we can be reminded of our weakness. But we thank you that we can know that Jesus is strong. And the, though we fall, his arm is there for us to lean on, that he is safe. He is a rock. And we thank you for that day when we will see him as he sees us face to face. And we long for that day when uh, there'll be no need for the sun even because the glory of Jesus will be enough light for, for us to see by. And we look forward to that day. Amen. Uh, a few notices. Uh, on Sunday at 10.30, uh, we're going to be ha having um, Jean-Marc Alter. I'm not sure if I'm saying that name right, but uh, he will be coming to uh, preach for us on Sunday at 10.30. And this is a reminder to book your places for services uh, in uh, August. Um, very welcome to, to come to the building, but we do need to make sure there's enough space for everyone. So please do book your place, reserve your place. Uh, also, a week today, uh, on Wednesday, we're going to be having an update from the elders um, as part of our midweek meeting. It's not a members meeting. Uh, Non-members are also very welcome. Um, so we'll be hearing from the elders an update uh, about what's happening in the church. Uh, one other thing, um, I don't know if you saw them as you walked in, but there are some shoe boxes uh, at the back, just uh, at the top of the stairs there. Um, please take them home if you would like a shoe box for whatever reason. Um, uh, if they're not taken home uh, tonight, I'll, I'll, I'll take them to Anna. Um, but please do help yourself. If you'd like a shoebox, uh, take a shoebox. Okay, let's, uh, let's turn to God in, in prayer again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you uh, that we can gather together. Thank you for making us part of your family Thank you for making us brothers and sisters. And thank you that despite wearing masks, uh, we can meet each other face to face as it were, and we can sing your praises. And Father, we continue to pray that uh, you would give wisdom to our, our leaders. Uh, pray that you would guard against um, factions and infighting. I pray that you'd help them to lead the country wisely uh, particularly at this time when um, we're navigating coming out of lockdown while still uh, fighting this virus. And I want to pray for Mark as he comes to preach uh, to us in a moment, uh, sharing your word. Uh, we pray for him that he would speak the words that you want him to speak and that you would help all of us uh, to open our hearts and to be changed by the power of your word by your spirit, as you get to work with your, your scalpel in our hearts. Please would you cut out anything that is not pleasing to you and help us to grow in ways that are pleasing to you as we meditate on your word together. And we pray this for your glory. Amen. Our reading this evening is from 2 Samuel chapter 15, starting to read at verse 13. 2 Samuel chapter 15. Um, this is uh, speaking about King David. He's been king for a while, and his own son, Absalom, has uh, rebelled against him and tried to take the throne. Uh, so we uh, join the story at this point in the middle of the story. 2 Samuel chapter 15 beginning to read at verse 13. And a messenger came to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servants said to the king, 
Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king decides. So the king went out, and all his household after him. And the king left ten concubines to keep the house. And the king went out, and all the people after him. And they halted at the last house. And all his servants passed by him, and all the Kerithites, and all the Pelethites, and all the six hundred Gittites who had followed him from Gath, passed on before the king. Then the king said to Ittai the Gittite, Why do you also go with us? Go back and stay with the king, for you are a foreigner and also an exile from your home. You came only yesterday, and shall I today make you wander about with us? Since I go, I know not where. Go back and take your brothers with you, and may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you. But Ittai answered the king, As the Lord lives, and as my lord the king lives, wherever my lord the king shall be, whether for death or for life, there also will your servant be. And David said to Ittai, Go then, pass on. So Ittai the Gittite passed on with all his men and all the little ones who were with him. And all the land wept aloud as all the people passed by, and the king crossed the brook Kidron, and all the people passed on toward the wilderness. And Abiathar came up, and behold, Zadok came also with all the Levites, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God until the people had all passed out of the city. Then the king said to Zadok, Carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. The king also said to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Go back to the city in peace with your two sons, Ahimaaz your son, and Jonathan the son of Abiathar. See, I will wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok, Zadok and Abiathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. But David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot and with his head covered. And all the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up, weeping as they went. And it was told David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O oh Lord, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Now over to Mark. Well, thank you, Nathaniel, and uh, nice to be uh, with you this evening. <clears throat> now, for many Christians, uh, David is something of a hero. He's the slayer of Goliath, the creator of Psalm 23, the greatest king that Israel has ever had. If only there were more modern-day Davids. Uh, except, of course, that only tells half the story. David was all of those things, but he was also a refugee forced to flee through vicious persecution from the all-powerful Saul earlier in the books of 1 and 2 Samuels. As we read earlier, his family fell apart when Absalom, one of his sons, tried to usurp David's throne and murder David and his followers. And this is a part of David's history that's often neglected. And yet, this story, we read only a tiny fraction of it today, it covers seven chapters of the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, the uprising of Absalom, seven chapters. Uh, the story itself will, is longer than this sermon on the story is going to be. It would take us maybe 30 uh, minutes or so to, to read it out loud, maybe a little bit longer. But we neglect this massive long story, this huge vital episode in David's reign. Why do we neglect it? Well, I think we neglect it partly because there's little that's edifying or encouraging about the story, at least at face value. In fact, you might think it's rather a depressing story, and I wouldn't pick a fight with you if you thought that. 
Uh, let's summarize the, the story briefly, not just the part that we read, but uh, in context. I was uh, grateful that uh, Nathaniel did a bit of that for us um, at the beginning uh, to help us uh, settle into the reading. But, but let's go back to chapter 13. Chapter 13 of uh, 2 Samuel, Absalom has fled the country after murdering his brother, Amnon, another of David's sons, of course. So one of David's sons murdered another of David's sons. Uh, Absalom spent three years in exile before David permitted him back to Israel. But when he came back, Absalom courted the favor of the Israelite people and noblemen. Uh, people would come to see the king, and Absalom would intercept them. Uh, he would uh, steer them away from David, and he persuade them that Absalom himself, he was the only one who was going to be able and willing to fix whatever problem that they had. So he constantly undermined David like that among the people. He recruited his own private army. And soon, as we've read, he declared himself to be king. And that's where we pick the story up in our reading earlier. David, as we've heard, was forced to flee Jerusalem. His fear, of course, that he would be cut down uh, where he stood. Now, whatever happened next in the story there would be no happy ending. There can't be after all of that. But what happened next was not just an unhappy ending, it was a catastrophe. There was a pitched battle. We're in the later chapters now, chapters 16 and 17. A pitched battle between David's men and Absalom's men. And more than 20,000 died. Now to try and put that figure in context for you, that means that the battle between Absalom and David claimed about twice as many lives as the battle for Normandy on the 6th of June, 1944. Twice as many. And of course, it was ferocious hand-to-hand -hand combat. David's men got the upper hand. Absalom fled. He would have escaped, but his mule dashed under a great oak tree, we're told, and Absalom was caught in the branches, and there he was cut down against David's orders by the commander of David's army. So David had won the war, but he'd lost his son and 20,000 of his people. And he was so full of grief that he cried out, Would I had died instead of you, O Absalom, my son, my son. He was so grief-stricken for his rebel son that he infuriated his own soldiers who had fought for David and whose dead friends and comrades were not being mourned by David because all of his focus was on his son. So David returns to Jerusalem in mourning. There's no triumphal homecoming, just an unholy row about which tribe of Israel should be leading David home. So it's a pretty depressing story. And there's no happy ending, and there's little moral to the story, really, except he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. There isn't much in the way of spiritual lessons to be drawn. It's no wonder, perhaps, that this story is on few Sunday school curricula. So, in the light of that, I can't really give you a sermon uh, this evening that says, we need to be more like David and less like Absalom. Because, well, that's not really true. We do need to be less like Absalom, certainly, but David's hardly a model for us here. Not in every way, in some ways, certainly, but not in every way. And frankly, if this is what it means to be like a David, we probably don't want to be like a David. This is not how we want to end up. This is not how it's supposed to be. But if we look at the story more closely, if we dig a little deeper, if we get beyond any moralistic teaching that there may be there, we'll find in this story that there are echoes that resound through human history to create a powerful and moving narrative that reaches right down to the heart of what it means to be a follower of God. So, so let's more, look more closely at this central part of the story, that part where David flees from Jerusalem. Them. There are three things um, I want you to note just at the beginning. I've got more than three points, but three, uh, three little points for now, right at the beginning of the story. Uh, the first one 
is very simple is this. David was betrayed. David was betrayed. You see, betrayal is right at the heart of this story, isn't it? Uh, David's suffering began because he was betrayed by those closest to him. Ultimately, of course, he was betrayed by Absalom, his son. Uh, but look at verse 31 of chapter 15. Uh, he was betrayed to there by a man called Ahithophel. Can you see it in verse 31? Now, Ahithophel, that's hard to say, I've been practicing. Ahithophel uh, was a friend, an advisor to David. Uh, we're told in 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23, that David values Ahithophel's advice almost as much as he valued the word of God. You, you can't get a higher comparison than that, can you? That's how much he valued Ahithophel. And yet it's Ahithophel that's betrayed him. In chapter 15, it's Ahithophel who urbed Absalom to violate David's concubines. In chapter 17, it's Ahithophel who asks Absalom for 12,000 men so that he personally could pursue David and destroy him. He's betrayed by those closest to him. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, when Ahithophel saw that his conspiracy was not going to plan, he panicked. Perhaps then he realized the enormity of what he'd done. And at the end of, end of chapter 17, Ahithophel hangs himself. But these betrayals hit David hard. It's no wonder they, that he wrote in Psalm 41, Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. David was betrayed. Uh, there's a second thing that we can notice, though, just as we glance at the story, and that's that David was rejected. Uh, it's obvious, but we need to be reminded of it. It wasn't all that long previously that David had been revered by the people. Uh, do you remember when Saul was on the throne of the people singing uh, songs to David? Uh, do you remember them celebrating him? Do you remember him leading the people in worship after the Ark of the Covenant was brought home? Do you remember his defeats of the Philistines and the way that that was celebrated? Do you remember that? David would have remembered that. In those early chapters of 2 Samuel, I think you'd say that the people loved David. But now, in chapter 16, Absalom didn't rebel against the king on his own. He rebelled when he'd calculated that more people wanted David out than he wanted David in. He rebelled when he was confident that many of the nobles and the army and the people in general had rejected David as king. This story couldn't have happened unless David was rejected, betrayed, rejected. Uh, thirdly, David is cursed. David is cursed. If the ignominy of being forced out of your own city and country wasn't enough, at this moment of greatest suffering, as he faced death, David was cursed. It's recorded for us in chapter 16, after the passage that we read earlier, a man called Shimei, who apparently had never forgiven David for having the audacity of uh, following on from Saul, who was uh, Shimei's favored king. He was from uh, the family of the house of Saul, we read in chapter 16 and verse 5. He curses David bitterly. So here is this fallen king, uh, trudging along the road as a refugee on his way to virtual exile. And Shimei is there at the side of the road, cursing, raining down curses from God, throwing stones and dust at David and his party. Your evil is on you, he says to David. In other words, you're getting what you deserve. This is the righteous judgment of God on you. He's cursed by Shimei. So betrayed, rejected, cursed... And of course, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, this might all seem very familiar to you, does it? It wasn't just David who was betrayed and rejected and cursed. David's son, who was born in David's town, was also betrayed and rejected and cursed. 
And that son's name, of course, was Jesus. Jesus was betrayed by his close friend, Judas. We know the story, don't we? Just like Ahithophel, Judas, who had been Jesus' constant companion for three years, turned against Jesus. He sold him, as you know, to the chief priests for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, Just like Ahithophel, Judas hanged himself when he realized the enormity of what he'd done. And just like David, Jesus said, he who ate my bread lifted his heel against me. You see, when Jesus quoted David's words in John 13, verse 18, he was telling us that Judas's betrayal was a fulfillment of David's psalm. He spoke those words in the upper room. There are echoes, you see, that come down to us through history. Uh, There are things that are true of David that must also be true of David's greater son. And so, like David, Jesus was betrayed by those closest to him. And there's more, of course. Uh, Not only was Jesus betrayed, but Jesus, of course, was also rejected by his people. Uh, Peter describes Jesus as a living stone rejected by men. The Apostle Paul wrote that Jesus came to his own people, but his own people did not receive him. Before they turned on David, the people loved him. And so it was with Jesus. For three years they'd watched his miracles. Many of them will have seen friends and family members healed by Jesus. They've listened to his teaching. They've stood in awe of him. But now they cry, crucify him. These echoes keep resounding. And Jesus was uh, not just betrayed and rejected, but of course he was cursed. David was cursed by the no good Shimei. Jesus was cursed by the crowd and the criminals who hung next to him. When Shimei was cursing David, David speculated that perhaps God had told Shimei to do this. Jesus had no such doubts. He knew he was being cursed by God. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, Paul reminds the Galatians, including Jesus. On the cross, Paul says, Jesus became a curse. It's almost as if, isn't it, that Jesus in his journey to the cross is walking in David's footsteps here. And he is. But not perhaps in the way that you think. Let's look again at David's actions once he knows of Absalom's betrayal. Verse 14 of 2 Samuel 50. Come, David says, we must leave. So with his most loyal friends, he leaves Jerusalem. Verse 23 tells us that he then crosses the Kidron Valley, which is immediately to the west of Jerusalem, to the east of Jerusalem, rather. Verse 30 then tells us that David climbs the Mount of Olives. And when Jesus knew that the reckoning, that that his day of reckoning had come, he makes exactly the same journey. After Judas' betrayal, Jesus tells his disciples in the upper room, Come now, let us leave. And with his most loyal friends, Jesus leaves Jerusalem. John 18 tells us that just like David, Jesus too crosses the Kidron Valley. Mark 14 tells us that just like David, Jesus too climbs the Mount of Olives. So as Jesus gets nearer to Calvary, he isn't just metaphorically walking in David's footsteps. He's literally walking in David's footsteps. And when both men get to the Mount of Olives, they pray. David has said, let the Lord do to me what seems good to him. Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. And there on the Mount, both men received sustenance from a messenger. David, physical sustenance from Hushai, the archite. Jesus for a quite different battle, spiritual sustenance from an angel. And these similarities between David's story and Jesus' story are not coincidences. 
David was the Lord's anointed, whose life pointed to the greater son who would follow in his footsteps. And these similarities have two purposes, I think, for us this evening. First, David's experiences showed all of God's people what it means to be the Lord's anointed, what it means to be the Christ or the Messiah. You see, like us, God's people seem to have viewed the coming Messiah as a triumphant king, as a slayer of giants, as a ruler of nations. The Messiah would be all of that, of course, but he would also be the suffering servant, betrayed, rejected, and cursed. Isaiah had it right, didn't he? He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. See, David's experience shows all of God's people what it means to be the Lord's anointed. But I think there's a second reason for the similarity between David's story and Jesus' story, and that's this. That that similarity adds to the evidence that Jesus truly is the Messiah, the anointed one the son of David. Uh, There are plenty of people who made that claim over the centuries, uh, but none can have claimed to have followed in David's footsteps quite the way that Jesus did. You see, these echoes of the past are not, of course, the only evidence for uh, Jesus' being the son of David, uh, being the anointed one. Jesus' miracles, his life, and especially his resurrection are also evidence that he is who he claimed to be. But these echoes, I think, help us to see that God's promises to David are being fulfilled in ways that are true to the Scriptures, but not perhaps exactly in the way that most people expected. And today, I think these these echoes from an obscure Old Testament story that most of us skim over if we read it at all, these echoes help us to believe. They help us to believe in Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord's anointed one, the son of David. They help us to believe in him, certainly. But I think they also help us to believe in the truthfulness of Scripture. There are so many of these echoes spread right throughout the Bible. Some are well known, others less so. But added together, these fulfillments, not just of Old Testament prophecies, explicit prophecies, but fulfillments of Old Testament stories and sayings and psalms and all sorts of things, together proves to us, reminds us of what we hopefully already know, that Scripture is divinely inspired and therefore uniquely authoritative and trustworthy. These echoes help us believe that, I think. No human hand alone could weave in all of the details that we see of New Testament fulfillment of Old Testament promises. But a divine hand, guiding many human hands, could weave such a glorious picture. And indeed, as we open our Bibles, we find did weave such a glorious picture. But I don't want you to think that Jesus only walked in David's footsteps and did nothing else, because that couldn't be further from the truth. You see, if David had fulfilled all that was really expected of him as God's king, then Jesus need not have come. Jesus needed to come precisely because David had failed. The giant slayer and the nation builder was also an adulterer, a murderer, and a failed father. Absalom's rebellion was at least partly of David's own making. But remarkably, David's route out of Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley and up the Mount of Olives didn't stop there on the mount. With God's help, David continues down the far side of the mountain and he keeps going down until he reaches the River Jordan. He crosses it and eventually reaches the sanctuary of Mahanaim. Mahanaim is one of those obscure places in the Old Testament that most of us probably have heard of but can't remember ever hearing about it. 
It was named by Jacob in Genesis chapter 32. It was the place where the angel of God met with Jacob just before he met with Esau. Jacob called it Mahanaim because he thought this place was God's camp. That's what Genesis 32 tells us. You see, denied access to Jerusalem, to the place where God was said to dwell, David flees to the place where his forefather met with God, the place that still bears that name. And it's in that place, Mahanaim, where David's enemy, and not David, is hanged on a tree. But Jesus' journey, which until that point had so closely matched David's, comes to a very different conclusion, doesn't it? Jesus never made it to the far side of the Mount of Olives. Because instead of fleeing from, him, from his enemies, Jesus waited for them in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew what was coming, of course. He prayed that the cup might be taken from him. But when it was not, he went willingly with his tormentors away from safety, away from the Jordan, back across the Kidron Valley, into Jerusalem, and ultimately to Calvary. Where David escaped to the camp of God, a place where angels met with men, Jesus carried his cross to the place of the skull outside the city of God. I said earlier that David's suffering was partly a consequence of his own sin. It's not just me that's saying that. Uh, Nathan the prophet drew a direct line between David's adultery with Bathsheba and Absalom's rebellion against David. This is what he said to Samuel 11, I think. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. You see, in killing Uriah the Hittite, David had chosen to live by the sword, and now he was reaping the consequences. Jesus, of course, took a very different path. When, on the Mount of Olives, Peter drew his sword to protect Jesus, Jesus has him put it away. He tells Peter, I, I don't want to live by the sword. When David flees to the camp of God, where the angels met with his forefathers, Jesus told Peter that he could appeal to his father and receive 12 legions of angels. But Jesus did not appeal to his father. Do you remember why? How then would the scriptures be fulfilled? Jesus said. And where David saw God defeat David's enemy by hanging him on a tree, Jesus became God's enemy as he was hanged. On a tree. And this whole story shows us that Jesus, the innocent one, suffered, while David, the guilty one, was set free. We started off by saying that the story, story we read from 2 Samuel 13 might be seen as rather depressing. And it is. At least on its own, it's depressing. The one who was supposed to rule and lead God's people and set them an example was rescued only when a donkey took a wrong turn under an oak tree. And although David does get rescued, there's not the happy ending that all of us crave. And that, of course, is true of most of the Old Testament. There are little peaks, don't misunderstand me, but there's not the happy ending. Because on its own, the Old Testament is incomplete. And the story isn't finished. And the happy ending hasn't come when we close our Bibles on Malachi or 2 Chronicles or whatever it is. What joy there is in the Old Testament comes often because of the hope of what's to come rather than necessarily what's already been received. And there's a strong sense, therefore, that the Old Testament is more relevant to us than possibly we give it credit for. Because we, too, live in a similar day, 
we too have a hope and an expectation of something better to come, and we live in the light of that. Just as David the sinner was reliant on God to rescue him from his sin, so we too are just as reliant on God today. But unlike David, we can see what David's life pointed to. Or more accurately, we can see who David's life pointed to. We see not just a momentary rescue from a botched rebellion, but an ultimate rescue from our own rebellion. We see not just a king return home after defeating his enemies. We've seen the king return into heaven after defeating Satan and death and the power of sin. And yet, like David and like God's people of old, we're still looking forward to our ultimate redemption. David saw shadows, glimmers of light in the darkness. We see in a mirror dimly, but we do so with the dawn firmly upon us, don't we? Jesus Christ experienced betrayal and rejection and curses. But we know, because the Scripture teaches us so, that that price has now been paid. And that means that our experience is different from Jesus' experience, but it's also different from David's experience. We do not experience betrayal at that level. Instead, as God's people, we know the faithful covenant love of God. We do not experience rejection as Jesus did. But instead, we know that we are accepted in the beloved. We do not experience cursing as Jesus did. Instead, we know that we are blessed by God. David He saw these shadows and glimmers. We see this mirror dimly, bathed with rising lights. And it's glorious compared with those Old Testament days, isn't it? To know Christ and to know all that God has done. To have the Holy Spirit come and dwell within us. To know the joy of sins forgiven and peace with God. To know that a sacrifice once for all has been made and never again will another sacrifice be required. That the blood has been spilt. That the price has been paid. Isn't it glorious to know all that compared with what David knew? What a contrast. And yet... What is ahead of us is perhaps an even greater contrast still of a day that is coming when Jesus returns from glory and puts everything right and we're given new resurrection bodies and we see Jesus face to face and we live with him forever Because he was betrayed, and he was rejected, and he was cursed. And so we will never be if our faith is in Christ. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you for the indescribable gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father in heaven, that uh, we might take what we've been reminded of or learned this evening And we would stand in awe and wonder of the Lord Jesus and all that he has done in our place. Father, we thank you that Jesus paid it all. And we do so, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, sing a song now. And uh, that uh, song is Hail to the Lord's Anointed
Father, we thank you for those uh, words that we've just um, sung together. Or every foe victorious, he on his throne shall rest. From age to age more glorious, all blessing and all blessed. The tide of time shall never his covenant remove. His name shall stand forever, his changeless name of love. Amen.